Our speaker for tonight um, came up uh, and approached me at the Brunswick Library where I now work. And that was probably two years ago, I think yeah. it was. Anyways, came up and said that his son thought this would be a good program for him, you know. <laughs> uh, and anyway, so we sat down and, and then he kind of told me about his story um, and what he, what he did. Uh, during World War II, uh, Mr. Bob Reynolds was a pilot and a member of the uh, 421st Black Widow Squadron uh, that flew P-61s, uh, night fighter squadrons. Um, this was in the Pacific Theater of War, and Mr. Reynolds uh, flew 95 missions and survived to tell the tale, uh, which obviously he's here. Um, I think that in itself is the story, you know, to unfold for this evening. One final um, announcement. Our, our speaker last month, Sid Friedman, Skip Friedman, uh, mentioned a lot of books, and I sent a, a, the list over the email. Then I, uh, he sent the letter he sent me with a list of books I have prepared. I only have 30 copies. I sent a copy to the reference desk here in Medina. So if you call them, they'll tell you the books. Um, not all the books are available through Medina, but there are, many of them are available through the Clevenet. Before you leave, I will make sure that the list of books is back there so the first 30 people can get it. You know, if I, if I make 200 copies, they get mad. So anyways, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Mr. Bob Reynolds. Thank you. Well, my life started, I was at Michigan State. Now I know a lot of people are from Ohio State. But I was born in Michigan, <laughs> and that's why I went to Michigan State. But anyhow, I was at Michigan State, and I remember it was a Sunday, and uh, somebody said they bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, none of us knew where Pearl Harbor was, and so we got talking about it. And the next, next morning at 8 o'clock, I had a conference, uh, a class, and it was uh, the professor... It was a lecture class where a lot of people sitting up. And this uh, professor said, ladies and gentlemen, boy, will your uh, lives change. And boy, was he right. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I had been in the ROTC for a couple of years. And I, my dad had been a fighter pilot in World War I over in France. And all I thought about was fighter pilots. So anyhow, I wanted to go in the Air, Air, Army Air Corps. So I went down to in, the, in Detroit to the Federal Building, and I signed up. <laughs> but anyhow, I found out later from my brother that my dad had to sign up for me because I was a younger, under 21. Anyhow, shortly after, I took a train uh, all the way out to California. And the first place I went to was Santa Ana, which was uh, the indoctrination for the Air Army Air Corps. And then after that, I went to uh, Mira Loma up at Oxnard. And that was a uh, flying school that was run by the civilians. And my instructor was a crop duster. And he had two crop testing planes. And he, he, uh, he, his name was Murray, and I remember him. He was a great pilot. But I, I learned to fly in the Stearman biplane. It was an open cockpit, but it was real good for acrobatics. <laughs> and anyhow, after getting 60 hours, then I finally went up to Bakersfield, where my first experience with the Army uh, pilots. And while I was there, uh, about three days later, I had a bad cold. And uh, of course, the procedure in flying a BT was a lot different than flying the Stearman. So I was having a hard time. He left me off for a, a day. And I spent a lot of time getting rid of my cold. And I also, uh, uh, worked on the procedures of what I have to do with the airplane. So when I went out to the airbase uh, two days later, 
He'd been shooting landings and takeoffs with his other three students. But he told me, he says, well, let's go up and do some air work. So we did, we went up and did some stalls and different things. And uh, then I did it pretty good. And so he said, well, let's go down and shoot some landings and takeoffs. So we shot a few. Well, at the end of the uh, 60 days of flying in basic, we went out, I remember there were four of us plus the instructor, we went out for dinner. And uh, on our way back, I was sitting near him and I said, let me ask you a question. I said, were you close to washing me out? He said, yes, I was. I said, well, boy, I just couldn't handle that. And I'll tell you, there, the washing machine going through pilot training is something else. A lot of, a lot of good guys go through, they get washed out, and it's a tough job. But anyhow, while I was in basic training, about halfway through, they happened to mention something about flying night fighters. Well, somehow I didn't think of the night. All I thought was a fighter. And I said, boy, that's for me. And uh, so then I went up to advanced in, in uh, Stockton, flew twin engines, different planes. And after I graduated, then I went up to, and flew 25s. Then they sent me down to Luke Field, and that's where I sh shot air-to-air -air groundery and air-to-ground. And uh, then I went on to Orlando, Florida. That's where they had the transition for the night fighters. Uh, when I arrived down there, they have three phases in the, uh, learning to be a night fighter. And the first one's instrument flying. And then, uh, then you hook up with a radar operator and later a gunner and you go on to the third phase. But anyhow, I got down to Orlando and uh, I was good, uh, taking instrument training and so forth. And one morning I was at the mess hall and uh, one of the fellows said to me, you don't have to go to the flight line this morning. I said, why? He says, <laughs> They're going to make you an instrument instructor. I said, what? I didn't want to be an instrument instructor. <laughs> I wanted to go overseas. Sure enough, I got to be an instrument instructor for a while. And I'd get about two, two pe uh, people to train every month. <clears throat> Anyhow, at the end of the year, they took and moved the whole night fighter transition from Florida out to California. And uh, I flew, I remember flying an A-20 out there. But uh, I landed at Fresno, that was one of our bases. And then I, they had the instrument training over at Salinas, California. And so <clears throat> I went over there and after a while I said, I wanna get out of this instructing. I said, I wanna go overseas. Of course, I'm young and nuts, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, they, I finally got out, I went over to Fresno, started going through the second phase of the night fighters, and that's where you pair up with a radar operator. And the fellow they paired me up with, he'd been a washed out navigator, but then he went to, through radar school. Well, one night, we were flying over the mountains to a place, and he couldn't use his radar, he had to use his, nav his uh, uh, being a navigation. Anyhow, he kept telling me the mountains were only so high, and I didn't believe him. And I kept easing on up a little bit. And it's a good thing I did because he had us lost. And, and there were a couple peaks that were about 10, 11,000 feet high, and I would have flown into those mountains. Anyhow, when I got back to Fresno, I decided I needed a new radar operator. If I was going overseas, I wasn't going over with him. And I could see why he got washed out as a navigator. But anyhow, I got another radar operator and I went through the course. And then I, we, I went over as a replacement with my, my radar operator and a gunner myself. They flew us over to Port Moresby, New Guinea 
on a C-54, and I think we had to lay on the floor of metal while we were going over there. But anyhow, we, we got in Port Moresby, and then they sent us to uh, the squadron, the 421st, which incidentally is still in existence today in the, in the Army Air Corps. There's a lot of them that were deactivated, but the 421st is still in existence. Um, so I joined the squadron in Nadzab in New Guinea, and shortly after, they moved our squadron down to a coral island. Now the Coral Islands, we were on several of them, and we had another squadron over there, the 418th, that we'd sort of bypass each other every once in a while. But anyhow, the uh, Coral Island, how it was made, the CBs, which were in the Navy, construction battalions, they would come in with their bulldozers and everything else, and they would knock off the trees and everything, and they would cut down to the coral, and that'd be our runway. And because the coral would disintegrate, they'd take and put on a truck with a water tank on it, and they'd keep spraying the coral so it wouldn't disintegrate. So anyhow, that's what we had. So the first time, that's the first time I got to see the P-61. I didn't fly one in the States. Uh, our P-61s were sent to Australia in boxes, and then our mechanics went down there and assembled them, and then got them up to our squadron. But anyhow, the first time I flew a Black Widow, it was off of this little coral island, and uh, I took up my radar operator and also a, a man that was on the ground who worked on radar sets. And they went up to check the radar to make sure it was working all right. So I was up flying around, and all of a sudden I found out my hydraulic system went out. Well, the hydraulic system operates your wheels, your flaps, your brakes, everything. And so I called my radar operator in the back of the plane, and I said, We've got a little bit of a problem here. Well, fortunately, when you go to fly a new airplane, you better learn the backup procedures before you go up. And so we had a small tank that we could build up. We had a, what we called a wobble pump that we could build up some pressure. So anyhow, I managed to get the wheels and flaps down. Understand, I can't bring them back up. They're down, period. And so I'm coming around to bring it in on the strip. And I bring it in, but I'm running out of strip. And there's another thing. I didn't have any more hydraulic fluid out of this here, uh, wobble pump. So they have a, a little thing you pull and it uh, actuates air to the brakes. So when I did that, just before I put in the drink, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep it on the strip. I pulled that. It blew one of the tires, but fortunately it was right in front of where our squadron was stationed. So they just pulled it off and put a new tire on. That was my first experience in a Black Widow. <laughs> Anyhow, we, uh, we went over a bunch of islands, uh, coral islands that the CBs would make for us, and also into New Guinea. And uh, we moved all the way up through New Guinea. Uh, incidentally, the, the thing we were doing there is they had a lot of bombers, uh, two-engine bombers that called the Betty, the Japs, and, and they'd come over. Fortunately, a couple of our fellows in the squadron knocked a couple down. I wasn't fortunate enough to be up at the time they were coming in, but it was quite a thrill to see them shoot them down. Incidentally, for armament, we had four 20, millimeter, four 20 millimeter cannons in the fuselage, and we had four 50 caliber machine guns. <coughs> each cannon had 200 rounds, and each machine gun had 500 rounds. So we had a lot of firepower. And for strafing, I could fire all eight guns with this little finger and this thumb on the wheel. The gunner sitting behind me, it was a remote control turret like a B-29. 
he could take and fire that turret. And then also my radar operator in the back, when it was swung around, he could fire it out the back. But I could also fire it in the strafing position. So uh, we, uh, one night, I was sitting on the airstrip and uh, there was an alert and I got scrambled. There was a bogey coming in. Our ground control radar had picked it up and uh, I, I, they vectored me on in, in, the dis, in, the, in the area of it. And then my airborne radar took over and he brought me in. But the thing is, I was coming in balls out and, and the, the uh, thing that we were going after was going so slow, I almost overshot it. So uh, I almost had dropped the wheels and flaps from overrunning it. But anyhow, I pulled up alongside and I could tell, it was a night, but I could tell the silhouette, it was a PBY-5, one of our Navy planes. They would go out on patrol, but then the Japs would take and trigger the IFF when they had it on, that's identification signal. And so they turned it off, but then when they came back in our area, they were supposed to turn it on. Well, they forgot to turn it on. So anyhow, I saw this PBY-5 out there and I'm flying out here. So I shot a burst of machine gun fire across its bow. And of course, every few uh, rounds, there's a tracer that you could see. Well, every light in that airplane came on and so did the IFF. I, I could have shut it down very easily, but, you know, one of our own guys, I don't want to do that. But uh, uh, we worked all the way along New Guinea until we got up across from BIAC. And then we went to the Philippines. Uh, Douglas MacArthur said, we call him Doug Out Doug, we shall return, and boy did we return but they threw everything at us when we were returned. We went, went to Tacloban on the Lady, and they, we were on a peninsula, and they put down a metal strip for, for our, our, uh, the land on. And, uh, but they were throwing everything at us. I know one night we were in and out of the foxhole all night long. Couldn't, couldn't even get our planes off. And, um, we, I remember this one night I was in and out of the foxhole. Well, I happened to, we happened to go to the mess hall to get something to eat. And I got back in the tent. I was laying on my cot. I had a cot and an air mattress. We really lived high on the hog. We had air mattresses to lay on. And so my radar operator was on the other side of the tent. I was over here and he was over here. Well, two Tonys got in the area and dropped two 500-pound bombs. Uh, and uh, we didn't have an alert that was sounded. But anyhow, it killed 39 people in our squadron. And one of them killed was my radar operator on the other side of the tent. It blew him dead right over the mosquito netting. Now, <laughs> I was fortunate I had my leather jacket hanging on the end of the mosquito netting. And I had so much shrapnel in that, it looked like rats had eaten it. And I blew the air mattress out from underneath me. And I had three holes about this size above me in the tent. And I just got some shrapnel. So uh, I was very fortunate I got through that. So anyhow, I got another radar operator. And uh, we, uh, in the Philippines, uh, we, we had a lot more activity as we went on because the uh, Japanese would take and operate at night their convoys and we'd try and find them and shoot them up. And then also, I, know, I remember one time they had a, a bunch of Japs over on the one side of Luzon and uh, they, they sent me in. I'd go in in the dark, come in just at daybreak and pull up just over the ocean and come in and I, of course, I blew the heck out of that town with them. Uh, we, had, we had some missions where we'd be up high waiting for them to come in at night 
and then we'd swoop down on them. Sometimes we got some and sometimes we didn't. But at least we, we took what we did going all through New Guinea and so forth. We didn't take a lot of land or anything. Over, I, I know over on the mainland there, I've flown over there and there would be a lot of Japs over there. And uh, we, 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 what we did, we neutralized the skies, but we'd pull out and there'd be a bunch of Japs behind us, you know. But we, as we moved out, we kept neutralizing the area. And boy, am I glad the Navy was out there. You know, sitting on an island. I sure didn't want them, the Japanese, to come in and land when I was there on an island. We, uh, we, uh, we did a lot of things, like the PT boats in, in, in the Philippines would be go out and strike at night, but then when they were coming back in the daylight, the Japanese planes would go down and try and shoot them. Well, what we did, We'd go off in the dark, and we'd know where they'd be, and we'd meet them just at daybreak, and then we'd fly cover for the PT boats so that they wouldn't get shot up. Uh, we had all types of different missions, but it, uh, you know, flying at night is different. You, you better rely on your instruments. Uh, of course, today they had even mo a lot more modern instruments. But back in those days, uh, it was a different type of flying. And uh, I remember one time we were up above Manila in San Marcelino, and it, we had a strip up there that was in the mountains. And the uh, as you take off, incidentally, we never used landing lights for takeoff or landing. Because if you'd come in on land with landing lights, that's when you could be shot down. And that's where we'd try and shoot other people down. But anyhow, we, um, we'd end up, we'd head for two flare pots at the end of the strip. And that's how we'd take off. And uh, I know one time when we were in, in uh, Tacloban, because they were bombing us all the time in the morning, they finally captured, the Army captured a small grass strip. I guess it was about 50, 60 miles south of our strip. And so they decided we'd go down there and take off there, this grass strip. Well, that grass was so darn high, your props would cut the darn stuff. And so what you'd do, you'd, you'd sit at the end of the strip, you'd hold the brakes, give it full throttle, and let her go and you in for the parking lights of a Jeep. I'll tell you today, and there were trees on both sides. If they gave me a million bucks today to do that, I'd tell them, go for, forget it. <laughs> but you know, if you're told to do something, you do it. But anyhow, we used that grass strip a couple of times. Uh, anyhow, we, we were in San Marcelino. That's up above uh, Manila. Uh, we were in a in a valley where we had to go out through a pass to get out. And our, our uh, ground control radar would vector us through this pass at night going up to get out. And I thought, boy, they, they better be accurate. And they were. And uh, I know one time we had to take a, a, a captain there was a non-flying officer that was with our squadron. He was in charge of the office and that. Had to take him over to Clark Field. They were just going to activate Clark Field. So we were flying over the mountains from there over to Clark Field, and I had the job of taking him over. Somehow he never got along too good with the flying officers. We had a lot of officers that did get along, but this particular individual didn't too well. So I'm flying over the mountains, and what I do, <laughs> I took and stopped my right engine and feathered the prop <laughs> straight. I'm flying over the mountains. So I'm flying along. He's sitting in the gunner seat behind me, just as unconcerned as can be. So before I come in to land, I unfeathered it. I came in and landed, and when we landed, he said, did you know that engine stopped? 
I said, no, did it? <laughs> but I thought, I'll get you. So I did. Now, that wasn't very nice, but that's what I did. Um, anyhow, uh, going all through New Guinea and up to the Philippines, I'll tell you, when we hit the Philippines, the Japs threw about everything they could at us because they, they didn't want us there. They wanted us to get out. And we had some real battles. Now, one night, uh, I was taking off, and I had a left engine explode on takeoff, and I didn't have any airspeed, or I didn't even have altitude. And so when, it, when the left engine blew, it threw me into my good engine, and I went into the drink, because it was a peninsula, so I went in the ocean at night. And uh, all I knew is I was in the water, so I undid my safety belt, and I went right through the canopy, took it out, I didn't have to open it. Anyhow, when I went out, we had Mae West on, but they weren't too good because they had these CO2 bottles, they were rusty and so forth. So the Mae West didn't work, but fortunately I had a parachute and my one-man life raft on me. And so I was going down for about the last time when I got the pin pulled on that uh, life raft and it inflated and it's the prettiest sound I've ever heard. And I came up and I got in it. I saved my gunner, but my radar operator, the gunner had been holding off for a while, but he ended up drowning. Anyhow, uh, those are some of the things that happened to you. Uh, and you just got to be prepared for it. So even though I had a lot of missions, I'm lucky to be back. Uh, now, any questions? Yes. Just, have you described a typical mission? A typical mission? Yeah. Well, a uh, typical mission, uh, maybe uh, we know there are some convoys, say in the Philippines, and they, they travel at night because they don't want to be recognized. So we'd know about where they are. So we'd go over and we'd shoot up these convoys. Or maybe they knew where a bunch of Japanese were located and it was on the other side of, uh, say the army had a line here and we were on this side and they were on the other side. So they'd have us go over and they'd know where they were and we'd fly over in the dark come in just at daybreak and come up and shoot it up pretty well. Now later on, we got hangers on our planes to carry napalm and bombs, but that was right at the end. Yes? You mentioned May West. Yeah. What, what is that? That's a, that's a life, life jacket. It inflates, but what happened we had these little bottles like you use for making salsa water, you know, CO2. Well, they didn't work, and the May West didn't blow up. It was supposed to, but it didn't. But that would have held us up. Pardon? What class of cadets were you in? 43. 43. Yeah. Uh, where'd you get the name Black Widow? Black Widow was made by Northrop, and uh, and it, it was painted black, and as as strictly designed as a night fighter plane. It had a twin tail boom, you know, like a P-38, and it had the uh, uh, pilot set way up in front, and then there was remote control turtle up up on the top. And right behind the pilot, that's where the gunner sat, and the radar operator was way in the back with his radar set. And it was a very maneuverable plane. It had uh, spoilers that came out of the wings, so you could really turn short. I know uh, for a while, they sent us from the Philippines over to uh, a lady, and Angor, the, uh, the islands over there, and they sent some of the Marines over to the Philippines and exchanged us. And I'll tell you, that, that uh, lady 
It wasn't a lady, but it was. Um, was it in the Philippines? No, it was out of the Philippines. It was another set of islands we got. I know in Angor, that's where the army had gone in, and the Marines went in on, on it was the Plow Islands, that's what it was. They went in there, and I'll tell you, I didn't like that place. It had a lot of crabs all over, rats and, and gnats. The gnats could get through your mosquito netting and, and bite you up. I know one night I was sleeping there, and I hate to say it, but a rat got on our, my bed. I kicked him and he went sailing across the tent. But we had a lot of dead uh, enemy all over the island. Yes, sir, John? What rank were you? What rank? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I was put in as a first lieutenant uh, back as an infantry instructor, and then when we went out, to California, we were in the 4th Air Force. All our promotions were frozen. So when I went over, I went overseas. Unfortunately, our CO uh, that was with the 4th 21st had sort of gone bananas. And so they sent him back to the States. So our highest uh, ranking officer in the squadron was the captain. And, um, Uh, so that's when I got my be a first lieutenant. And then when I, I got recalled during the Korean War, and I had gone, it was at Biloxi, Mississippi, and it gets pretty hot there in the summer. You can wring your shirt out at, at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. I had a chance to go to uh, school in Denver, so I took it. Well, when I, when I came back to Keesler, the major who had been in charge of the transportation, they had moved him to training command headquarters. And who do you think became the transportation officer? Me. <laughs> I, I flew uh, helping uh, train radar operators, but I had a 45 ton diesel electric, and I had uh, 28 airmen, two warehouses, and 16 civil service workers. So that was a change. <laughs> But I, I didn't get very high. I got a grandson who's in the service now. He's already been approved as a major. And my dad, he went back in World War II. He had, he's the one that was in World War I. And he told my mother, he said, now when I get stationed in the States, he said, I'll send for you and my younger brother. My gosh, in, in five days, he reported to Anacosta Field in, in Washington there. Five days later, he was over in England with the 8th Air Force. <laughs> and then when they formed the 12th Air Force down in, down in uh, Africa, he went there. Then when they formed the 15th, he went to Italy. So he, he spent a lot of time in the service. My brother is a retired pilot, and so is my grandson now. And uh, my brother-in-law is, is a retired pilot. So we've had a lot of pilots in our family. Yes, sir. Did you uh, engage any Japanese fighters in air-to-air -air combat? I did when they first landed. Uh, we had, we really had some fights, uh, you know, where the convoy was out there and that. And I know one time I had one on my tail and I, I, I dove down and I, went, I remember I went up to 450 miles an hour, but I got them off my tail. But uh, there was so much shooting and everything else you couldn't tell. I know you should be able to, but it was, it was really a, a wild thing. Did you do a lot of night vision training? Uh, I did a lot of instrument training which allowed you to fly at night. Yeah, you had to, because you're strictly in the dark and you have to really rely on your instruments. And if you don't, you're in trouble. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I did a certain amount of that too. Yeah. How many aircraft did you have in the squadron? Oh, we must have had about, uh, I think about eight 
about 12 or 18, somewhere around that. I can't tell you exactly. But, but, but I'll tell you, it was a real good airplane. I really liked it. We used to dogfight with the Marines when I was in the Plow Islands, and I could cut my inside engine, and with those spoilers, I could actually turn inside of them with a twin engine airplane. So fighting uh, with an F4U. Yes, sir. You partially answered my question. I wanted to ask you how you enjoyed flying the P61. I loved it. It was a wonderful airplane. It really was. Northrop built it, and they really did a, a great job. It was strictly built for night flying. Well, were you familiar with the F-15 blue reconnaissance version of that aircraft? No. It was 4,000 pounds lighter. Oh, really? No armament. 11 cameras. Of course, you know, the reason we had the two engines is we had a lot of uh, ammunition and the radar and everything. That all weighed quite a bit. But, uh, you know, you, you, you load up those cannons and those machine guns with all that ammunition, you got a lot of weight in that. I have a question over here. Yes, sir. Could you tabulate all that and put it into a book or an article? Because you have a, a lot of water has gone over your dam, so you want to record it. Well, I'm just glad to be back, but I'll tell you, when they said night fighters, all I thought was that fighter, and I didn't realize what I was getting into. I'm glad I got into it, but I'm glad I got through it. But I'll tell you, flying at night, another thing is... Um, Sometimes there'd be a mission that the day fighters couldn't take because they didn't have the training and instruments. And so we got to go uh, on this mission. Um, one thing, we were right on the equator there, and I'll tell you how we did our laundry. We took a, we took a, a, a rope off the tent, and we'd run it through our shorts and through our, our shirts and everything, and we'd take and hang it out over in the ocean, and the salt water would come and wash against it. We'd have it tied, say, to a log out there. And then we would take it off while it rained about every day on the equator. So then we'd, 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 we'd take it off from the salt water, put it on the tent. The rain would wash out the salt water. The sun would come out and dry the clothes, and we'd put them on. That was our washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> How old was I? Well, I was 20 when I graduated, uh, when I got my wings in commission. Like I said, when I went down to uh, Detroit at the federal building, I didn't realize it, but my dad had a sign for me because I was, uh, I was under 21. So... Uh, got a question over here, Bob. <laughs> and now I'm 88. <laughs> you just turned 88, you told me yesterday. Yeah. You had a birthday. The other day. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, the Japanese, they were known for their cruelty to prisoners. Were you guys given any special instructions? I'll tell you, over there we didn't take any prisoners, as you know, like they did in Europe. Either killed or be killed. And uh, that's just the way they were, and that's the way we were. It was, it was different than, you know, in Europe and that. And they were cruel. They, uh, we, we'd uh, go on some of these islands and they'd have, you know, different people, Chinese maybe they'd taken women or something and taken along, you know, that we found them dead. And of course, I'll tell you, in the Plow Islands, I saw an awful lot of dead Japanese. It just, it just didn't take prisoners. Uh, you mentioned several times about a convoy and you're flying at night. Does those, that convoy have lights or how did you find them? Oh, they'd have lights. They'd be going down the road. They'd have headlights on in that. And that's how we'd find them. Well, there was a head, there was a head maintenance uh, man and then he usually had a couple assistants. And I'll tell you, they were good. Of course, when I put the one in the drink, 
the guy said, that was my fault. Well, it wasn't my fault, that's what happened. And they, well, there's a book out on the night fighters, and I know a couple of the other squadrons had engines blow up. It was a Pratt & Whitney R2800, just like the jug had, the P47. But it was a good engine. But it's happened other times. What were your primary targets? Whatever was, well, uh, when we were down in New Guinea and so forth, it was probably to, to get the Betty bombers and the different Japs that would come in and drop bombs at night. And then uh, in the Philippines, we had all kinds of targets. Like I said, we used to cover the uh, PT boats coming back. And uh, uh, they give us different things to shoot up, and that's what we do. We uh, try, try to be an element of surprise, like go out in the dark and go in in the daybreak, you know. Yes. Did you make that your career? Was that your own? No. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But uh, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, my whole family have been pilots and, and uh, in the Air Force. And, uh, I got a grandson that's in there now. He's been, uh, he's already been moved up to major in that. He's doing real well. And he's on fast track to go up and he'd like to stay in. Yes. Yes, in the Philippines we did. Got married? <laughs> Is that a lady there? <laughs> yeah. I uh, I landed. I I came back. You know when I went over. First they wanted me right away, so they flew me over. Then when they're done with me, <laughs> they, <laughs> they sent me back the boat. And, and it, was, it was near the end of the war, so we zigzagged all the way back to San Francisco. And uh, the day I landed on San Francisco, they were waving in the paper about the atomic bomb. And so I got out shorty, shortly after that. But then, like I said, I had to go back in during the Korean. Yes, sir. No. And just had the, the Pratt and Whitney R2800. But I'll tell you, they were powerful engines. Yes, sir. Pardon? Water, I, water injection? I don't, I don't know if they did or don't. I wasn't a mechanic. I just flew it. Pardon? Yeah. The same as the... Uh, as a, as a, well, I know it's the same as the jug, the 47. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, uh, I got recall for flying in Korea. But I got sidetracked, <laughs> and that's what happened. I went to Langley, then I went down to uh, uh, Panama City at, uh, no, it was, yeah, it was in Florida. Uh, uh, but they had so many of us fall back, they didn't have room for all, all of us to get current in flying again. So that's how I got sent over to Keesler, Blixey, Mississippi. Now some of the others, you know, they got flying the jets and so forth. And some ended up in bombers and they ended up all over the place. But, <laughs> but I ended up a transportation officer. It was different. Did you get that? Pardon? Yes, that's how I got called back. Well, it probably 300, 350. It was, it was a, I'll tell you, it was a good airplane. Like I said, uh, the fastest I've gone is 450 miles an hour in it.
Downhill. Downhill. <laughs> Getting away from somebody. I have a question about your, your number of missions. Yes, sir. Um, usually they had a cutoff, you know, for some, you know, if you get so many missions, you get to rotate home or... That's mostly in Europe. But they didn't have that in... No, uh, in Europe, they, uh, of course, a lot of them are flying bombers. They get 25, 30 missions, you know. They, they, weren't, they were lucky not to get shot down. But anyhow, we, we had a lot more missions over there. We had a lot more things happen to us, too. Mm -hmm. What was the duration of time on the missions that you counted? It varied. Um, sometimes it'd be over an hour. And uh, it depended where we went and what we did. Sometimes it'd be a lot more. You know, a lot, if more, it, what, a lot more time. Oh, I'd say two, two and a half hours. By comparison, in Europe, the typical flight was seven hours, eight hours. That's right. They're flying bombers. Exactly. Yeah. But I didn't want to fly bombers. I wanted to fly fighters. I just didn't know it would be night fighters. <laughs> it was different because you're, you're flying on the gauges. Incidentally, we didn't have any lights on in the airplane. What we had... We had a fluorescent light back here that would cause our, our dash to glow. So we didn't have any lights. And then as we're sitting on the airstrip uh, waiting to be scrambled, we'd have on goggles or something like that, you know, so the lights wouldn't affect us. Like I said, we never used uh, landing lights for takeoff or landing. Yes, sir. Do you have any collisions of the other planes that were in your formation flying in the dark like that? No. The radar kept us apart. I'll tell you, that radar was great. Yes, sir. Well, the ground control radar would bring us in on the bogey, and then our airborne would take over. I can't tell you exactly the range of our airborne, but it was it was good. Uh, I I know that the radar was quite effective. Yes, sir. When? Well, let's see. It was back, you know, a while back. You got to think. No, it was, uh, it was in about 43, or first part of 44. I graduated in 43. Yes, sir. They were lousy. We had, we had a lot of clouds build up, you know, on the equator there. And, you know, um, you didn't have another place to go and land to get fuel. A lot of times, if it, you got real bad weather over your base, you got to get in there because that's the only place you got to go. So we had a lot, a lot of bad weather. In fact, they changed it from night fighter pilots to all weather fighter pilots <laughs> because we did fly in a lot of bad weather. No, but I'll tell you, those coral strips weren't much longer. <laughs> they, they, no, they, <coughs> yes, sir. I have a comment to, to you. I'm a 51 pilot. Yeah, you know, you were in Europe, too. No, I weren't. I, I never got overseas. Oh, you didn't? But see, the 51s were all in Europe. We never got them till the end of the war. I want to comment to you with your presentation. You bring these bring back memories in my flying days. I mean, it, Good. it's very enlightening. I yeah. mean, I, 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 that 51 was a great airplane, but we didn't have them in the Pacific. They had them all over in Europe. And at the very end of the war, they brought some over. And I'll tell you, I'm glad that people can say all they want about the atomic bomb. 
but it saved a lot of Japanese lives and a lot of our lives because a lot of the guys were moving up. Our squadron was up at, uh, about to go in, and uh, I think it saved a lot of lives. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, World War II pilots are over here. Where's your name? I mean, World War II pilots? You got about four. Any more questions? Yes, yes sir. Yes, you conduct any missions with the Black Cat TUI night aircraft? Did you coordinate any missions with them? No. No, uh, uh, our training was real good. Uh, they went down in Orlando, the fellows going into night fighters, they had several pilots come back from the RAF. Our, our people had flown with the RAF, and they used them as some of the squadron commanders and so forth. And uh, they formed a lot of the night fighter squadrons in Orlando there before they went out to California. And then they would send them all over the world. So some went to Africa, some went to Europe, and some went all over the place. In fact, when I said I wanted to go overseas, I didn't know where I was going. But I, I found out that there's, well, New Guinea is, is, is not the place to ask for, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> they got a lot of things over there, like jungle rot and everything else. <laughs> yes, sir. When you were scrambled for a night mission, did you go out as a squadron or did you go out on a, a solo? Solo, usually. Yes. And they might have a couple of different places. Maybe one guy go one place and one guy another place. Yes, sir. Recreation? Would you do recreation? Anything? I don't. I don't know if we had much recreation. <laughs> I don't think we did. No, I don't think so. It's, it's different. In, it's different over in the Pacific. You know, you, you mentioned that old pyramid. Yeah, that was a great airplane. That was the best airplane ever. It really was. Uh, I mean, you could throw that around the sky. I mean, that was it was. Awesome. It was very maneuverable. <laughs> You could put in a spin and pull it out. It was it was great. You can fly a spearman, you can fly, fly anything. We used to we used to uh, argue among the pilots. Some flew uh, Fairchild and some other planes. We'd always say who's who flew the best plane, you know, in primary. Well, of course, I loved the spearman. You're sitting outside, you know, an open cockpit. But it was it was it was a great biplane courses I took before and they said I would need about 45 credit hours I said well I'm already retired forget it but I thought if I could do it for 12 credit hours or something you know I'd do it so the my education got interrupted by the service it took two wars to do it though so that's pretty yeah. good yes sir have you ever visited Japan since the war, and what are your feelings today about the Japanese? Uh, I'm not against them now, uh, and I haven't visited Japan. My granddaughter was just over there. Uh, I, it was it was different in wartime. You know, they they were out to kill us, and we were out to kill them. And it, it was just different. Uh, I have no feelings against them today. Uh, I don't drive any Japanese cars. I drive American cars. Any other questions? Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was too young for WWE. After the World War II, the government offered anybody that would enlist in any branch of the service full board one of two GI Bill benefits. I jumped on it when I got out of high school in 1936. I wound up doing occupation duty in Japan. And some of the countryside that I saw 
we would have lost millions of people to try and invade it. That's right. <coughs> With mountains where they didn't have a mile of shore to the seashore. And we heard stories of how those mountains had been built up with fortifications. It would have been a massacre. It would have been. A lot of people yeah. think that Roosevelt or Harry Truman made a big mistake. Oh, he did the right thing. Um, I don't agree with him. I agree with you. He lived long enough yet for people to realize how great a president he was. He was. He was great. I agree. Yes, sir. What did you do for R and R? That's what. Well, I'll tell you. I I didn't bring that in, but I went to Australia twice. <laughs> I went down to Sydney, Australia. We flew down there, and we even had a fat cat. It was a C-47 that we'd go down and and use that to fly down. But uh, uh, Australia, it was it was different. You know, you could get fresh fruit and vegetables and and first drinks. They have they have the best beer, you know, it's twelve percent. <laughs> you know, I, I I took my wife after the war back to Australia. I'd been there twice and so I was back a third time. We really changed them because they started using ice and that before it was warm, you know. And uh but we we uh we changed them somewhat. But they really treat us good, of course. You know, there a lot of their guys were out in the jungle, and uh, they they really appreciated the Yanks being over there. You know, because you know those Japanese got pretty darn close to them. Yes, yes ma'am. I had a brother sitting with the Marines on Midway Island in Pearl Harbor that. Ended up on Iwo Jima. Yeah. And I just want to say three cheers for that to come and find the end of the whole thing. That's right. That's the way I feel. Do yes, we sir. only have two atomic bombs or there are more left? No. Just two? I don't know. What did we drop two, didn't we? I don't think there was a third one. Though. We didn't have to. No, I didn't ask and reserve, you mean? Was there? I don't know. No, nobody can answer that. No. But that was Harry. Harry, he he did the right thing. We built them to use them. Yes, yep. Arlene. Well, there were three bombs, and all because in 1945 they did the fifth bomb. My 90-year-old brother and 89-year-old sister-in-law were developing, helping develop the atomic bomb. Oh, really? In Los Alamos, and were present at the test and they sat on the ground about 200 feet away with their backs to the. <laughs> They had no idea what was going to happen. That was exciting. And it, yeah. it worked, but they didn't know until it did what, that it would work. It was quite an unusual time. Absolutely. Any more questions? Well, I really want to thank you, Bob. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you so much.